Hi, everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to uh, fall of 2023, our new academic uh, uh, year. And uh, we, uh, we are just so pleased to have you here today. We have a very, very special person, uh, someone who's one of our own from the Inland Empire. Her name is Juanita Mance, and uh, we are going to uh, keep you hanging for a few minutes while we read the land acknowledgement. And then uh, my colleague, Ravi Madrigal, will, uh, will, will talk, uh, will tell us a little bit more about Juanita. But again, thank you so much for joining us, and I'll hand it over to George. All right. Uh, we recognize that California State University San Bernardino sits on the territory and ancestral land of the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians, the Uhavi Atom. We recognize that every member of the California State University San Bernardino community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institute founding in 1965. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm Indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold California State University San Bernardino more accountable to the needs of American Indian and Indigenous people. I'll hand it over now to Robbie. Uh, thank you, Matt. Um, uh, Juanita E. Mance is a USC law educated lawyer, writer, performer, and podcaster who believes writing has the power to change the world. She graduated from UCR in 1999 with a degree in English literature and from USC uh, with a law degree in 2002. Uh, she's been a criminal defense uh, attorney with the law offices of the Public Defender Riverside County for over 15 years and specializes in representing mentally ill clients. Juanita is a creative nonfiction writer who has published two books. Her memoir, Tales of an Ill Empire Girl, uh, I encourage everyone to get a copy of it, um, is about uh, her chaotic uh, IE childhood and her high school dropout year. Uh, it was the finalist for the 2023 Latino Books to Movie Awards. Uh, her chat book, A Portrait of a Deputy Public Defender, or How I Became a Punk Rock Lawyer, uh, is about the horrors of mass incarceration. It won a gold medal uh, at the 2002 International Latino Book Awards for Best uh, First Book Nonfiction English. Her stories have appeared, have been published in literary journals, newspapers, and anthologies. Um, her video podcast, Life of Jim, uh, we'll put it in the chat. Uh, in this uh, podcast, she does live interviews with writers. Her next project is creating venues for those impacted by incarceration uh, to tell their stories. Um, I just want to mention there are a number of individuals who work behind the scenes to make this program possible. Um, I want to mention their names, uh, Pamela Crossan from the History Department, Alan Lavore from the Office of Strategic Communications, and Thin Lee, uh, who has been providing IT support um, for this series since it began in May 2023. All of those individuals helped to make this program possible, and we wanted to thank them, acknowledge them at this time. Uh, with that said, uh, Juanita, it's all yours. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. It's such a joy. Thank you for that lovely introduction, um, Robbie. And I have to say that at my core, despite everything I've done in my life, I'm still that blue collar punk rock girl who used who dropped out of high school, who used to sit at the park and read her books. So I'm honored to be here. I grew up in Ontario, California. I moved uh, to San Francisco and Houston. I came back to San Bernardino and I've been a Riverside County public defender for over 15 years after leaving corporate law. I'm so honored for you hosting me and I have to thank all the people at CS, uh, CSUSB that made this possible, especially Professor Jerry Murray, Robbie Madrigal, Stan, Mary, Michael, Matt, and Finn. So I am a deputy public defender in Riverside. I am on the ground punk rock boots on the ground. I am not a manager. I'm not a supervisor. I run a program for the most mentally ill clients in Riverside who are deemed incompetent to stand trial under Penal Code Section 1368. We only take felony clients who are diagnosed with the three most severe disorders, bipolar, schizophrenia, and schizoaffective. All my clients are poor. All my clients are homeless for the most part, and all my clients are black, brown, or poor white folk. And the county built a very nice place for my clients with full services, and I work on getting them through our program and their cases dismissed. I have two books, like Robbie said, 
my long memoir, which took me over 15 years to write after my dad died. And it's called Tales of an Inland Empire Girl. It starts with my dad's death and then it flashes back to my childhood. And it ends with me dropping out of high school at 17 years old, five units short of, of a diploma. Then it flashes forward to me being at USC Law School and becoming a public defender. But first, and I published that in 2022, but first in 2021, during the height of COVID, I published this book, Portrait of a Deputy Public Defender or How I Became a Punk Rock Lawyer. The title is based on James Joyce's Portrait of an Artist. And it's really about my path from high school dropout to corporate lawyer to punk rock public defender. And it's about the intersection between punk rock, public defense, and mass incarceration. I wrote and published it at the height of the pandemic, like I said, right after George Floyd was murdered by police. It started with an article that I wrote for Al Jazeera, and uh, we'll put the link in the uh, comments. And I was asking in that Al Jazeera article why no one cared about my clients, my severely mentally ill clients who were sick in the jails. And I remember one client in particular, I won't give his name, but he was in on a technical parole violation and he was being evaluated for competency and it was taking months. During COVID, it broke us. It broke the system. And instead of taking 30 months for an evaluation, it was taking 90 days. And this client had high risk factors. He had asthma. And I spent a week writing a motion after his mom called me and I started writing them for all of my clients. And the judge did grant some of them, but I felt like no one cared. The district attorney opposed every single motion based on my client's mental illness, which was discriminatory. So the only ones that got granted were, places, were the ones where my clients had places to go. And the man who had asthma, his motion was granted. And his mom called me crying when she picked him up. And I, I still get emotional because I started crying too. And that's when I realized that I needed to do more. I was desensitized. I've been doing public defense for over 13 years at that point. And you have to be desensitized to do the work, but I was too desensitized. So I decided I was going to amplify my voice for those who could not be heard. And I pitched this book to a press called Bamboo Dart. Bamboo Dart Press is an uh, amalgam of Telekinesis in Claremont and the uh, punk rock label Shrimper Records and Mark Givens and Dennis Kalachi took a chance on me. I hadn't published a book yet and they published this book. So I'm going to read from this book because I think it's the most relevant. And I wrote this book for my clients. I wrote it for myself because I don't believe in the system anymore. I don't call it a system of justice. I call it a system of injustice. I'm an abolitionist at this point. I wrote it for my clients' families. I wrote it for public defenders who were suffering with COVID and all the stress, crushing workloads. But it's really about how we need salvation, not incarceration, and also about how my own story as a high school dropout who grew up right here in the Inland Empire is my magic wand for me as a public defender, because I remember what it was like to have no money, no car, and no hope. And my clients need hope. They need someone to fight for them. We need to change the world and believe in redemption. And remember that someone's first act is not their last. But the question is always, how do we do that? So here we go. I'm going to start off with, um, this is actually a hybrid book of essays. So it has poetry which I think is um, powerful for these kind of subjects. And it also has memoirs, and then it has um, social justice essays. So the first poem in the book is called Static. And it's basically based on this Joy Division song called Transmission that has a lot of uh, static in it. I always use music as my inspiration. So I, I kept on listening to that song over and over, and this is kind of where I got static. Can you hear me screaming in my head? Let my people go, let me go. Saying, let us go. Release everyone from the system that hurts us all. As a deputy public defender, I used to think I could work within it, but now I see it's broken. 
Can you hear me? Screaming in your ear, listen to me, please. Listen, listen. Let me do what I do, then let me go from this misery of banging my head. My ears are ringing from the beat of cuffs on bars of cells across America. Are you there? Can you hear me? Screaming your name, it all still remains. Excuse me, excuse you, forgive me. Forgive us all. We know not what we do, or maybe we do. So that obviously has a religious bent, but um, the next piece I'm gonna read is about my own story and how it intersects with being a public defender. Um, I was asked to kind of talk about how I got here. And ironically enough, this story is based on a talking head song and it's called, How Did I Get Here? It is 1989 and high school graduation day at Chafee. I know it's 1989 because Pizza Hut is still a restaurant. Everyone walks around school with their Walkmans, concert tickets are cheap and you still have to wait in line at Music Plus to buy them. 1989 is the same year The Cure releases the album Disintegration, the best album ever. 1989 is also the year I drop out of high school, five credits short of a diploma. I'm sitting in the high school bleachers with my mom, my dad, and my younger sister, Annie. I am supposed to be graduating today, but I threw it all away. This former straight-A student went from goody two-shoes to punk rock high school dropout. It only took me months to ruin my life. My Tio Roland, who is a dead ringer for Wolfman Jack, is here. I can sense his disappointment. When my twin sister Jackie, who is graduating, walks up in her graduation robe and cap, he says, Congratulations, Miha, in a gravelly voice. I look up into the sky and I blink. My mom won't look at me. She says I broke her heart by dropping out. I remember my mom teaching me and Jackie to read when we were three at the kitchen table. My dad puts his hand on my shoulders. I push his hand away and I go hide underneath the school's bleachers. They cover me in their shadow. I think, how did I get here? I was in all gifted classes. I was supposed to go to Claremont McKenna. I got good grades, but you see, school wasn't hard, life was. Instead of going to class senior year, I slept all day and drank all night. The worst part is I never really made the decision to drop out. I remember my mom saying there was no money for school, no money for college. I had no idea about student loans. I just gave up. It was easier to sleep all day than to try to make my way through the darkness. The truth is, I've been fighting depression for years. I grew up in chaos with upheaval and fighting. Things got worse when my dad lost his bar senior year and then the house. My parents would fight every night and I would blast my Smiths and X albums to blast to drown it all out. After the, they lost the house, we moved from rental to rental like nomads. There were bright points, ditching with my friends, concert after concert in Hollywood, but those moments were just an escape, really. Back under the bleachers, it smells like piss. I light up and tears drip on my cigarette. I wipe at my thick Susie Sue lined eyes with the edge of my Sex Pistols tee. Music from the school's marching band echoes in my ears. I stare down at my monkey boots and tap my feet on the concrete, thinking I am a fucking loser. My life is over. Then I think of being at the Hollywood Palladium and seeing the Smiths and how I danced and screamed with joy when Morrissey took the stage. When my twin sister's name is called, I flinch. I know I can't watch her walk. Look. I know I should go out into the sun and watch her graduate. She's my wonder twin, but I can't be happy and I bury my head in my arms. I am not a cool punk rock girl anymore. It was all just an act. Sobbing, it's come out, coming out of me like water from a broken tap. As I stare down at the concrete beneath my feet, I think back to sitting at the park when I, would, when I was little 
And how I would always wonder, is everyone's life like this? The lyrics to my favorite song by the Smiths echoes in my head. And if a double-decker breast cut crashes into us, to die by your side is such a heavenly way to die. Did I want to die? I wipe at my face and shake my head. I decided that moment that I want to live. I want out of this pissant town. I want to prove myself to everyone who's given up on me. And I think all is not lost. I need a plan. I could take my GED and go back to college. I tell myself, you will be okay. Tomorrow is another day. And tomorrow was another day. And there were many more days. I worked and worked. It took years and years. My journey was not a straight path. I took the GED the summer after I dropped out and passed it easily. All my honors classes had paid off. I started waitressing, and when I saved enough, I moved into an apartment and relished the quiet. I enrolled in junior college part-time. I ran the school newspaper. It was hard with no reliable car, walking to work, begging for rides to school, but I made it work. It took me years and years to transfer to UC Riverside, but once I finally did, I graduated magna cum laude from UCR in two years with an English literature degree. I applied to law school on a lark. When the large envelope came in the mail from USC Law School, I knew my life was changing forever and that I would be okay. Almost two decades ago, I graduated from USC Law School wearing a cardinal and gold cap and gown my parents were in the audience. My sisters and my best friend Tracy waved at me with smiles. No longer was I that sad dropout girl hiding under the bleachers. I had made it. After a detour into corporate law, I found my destiny as a deputy public defender, one who represents the most mentally ill in Riverside, California. I've been doing this work for a decade and I'll probably do it a decade more. Whenever I feel it is too much, too sad, too traumatic, I think my clients need me. That need is everything. It gives me my purpose. And ironically enough, being a high school dropout is my magic wand. My history is what makes me a great public defender. I have been where my clients are, sad, hopeless, I've had no money, no car, no hope, but I made it out. Recently, I represented one of the saddest clients of my career. Many people would have given up on her, yet my persistence and visualization for this client made a miracle happen. There are few happy endings in my line of work, but I saved this client from prison and she will be in a safe place. And actually she just went home. My clients are all in dire situations, but no matter what their circumstances are, I always try and give them hope. I tell my clients what I told myself so many years ago underneath those bleachers. Tomorrow is another day. You will be okay. Thank you. Okay, so um, the final piece I'm going to read is something I wrote for the Riverside Lawyer, and I actually wrote it right after George Floyd, and we had done, um, we had done a, um, all public defenders across the nation actually marched for George Floyd, and this was the first time I really got on a microphone and performed um, something I had written, and so um, after that I wrote this essay. It's called A Reimagining. As I sit here, after enduring a pandemic, I think to myself, humans are an adaptable species, but perhaps that is our weakness. We cannot always see the danger, even when it is in our faces or sits on our chests. We adapt to circumstances without even realizing the scariness of the situation. When I first became a deputy public defender more than a decade ago, I adapted too. At first, I was horrified by all of the people in custody. And then, like most of us who work within the criminal system day in and day out, I became somewhat desensitized. That's not to say I stopped caring. I have always cared so much it hurt. 
But somehow, even my empathetic soul stopped being shocked by the mass incarceration and subjugation of so many human beings. I stopped being shocked by double digit offers from the prosecution, offers that I had to relay to my clients. Prosecutors would routinely ask my clients to plead to long prison sentences of 10 to 15 years while implying that they could get a worse sentence should they take it to trial. That's a hell of an offer, especially when I believe these clients deserve probation, not prison. I stopped being shocked by the abandonment of so many of the mentally ill to the streets and jails. I became accustomed to seeing police reports charging a mentally ill person in the throes of a delusion with a felony resisting arrest or criminal threats, both felonies. I stopped being shocked by the subjugation of so many people of color, poor people, and the mentally disabled. Last year, that changed for many of us with the, with the killing of George Floyd. That dam finally broke, and I said, no more. Many of us prayed in our heads, I am sure, for something to finally change. We pledged to do more. But have we? Ask yourself, have we? When we deputy public defenders collectively marched for George Floyd in what feels like eons ago in this pandemic changed world, it felt hopeful. On that day, it felt like things were going to change. People were finally speaking up. Things that had been unsaid for far too long were being shouted. As Professor Angela Davis, who is one of the most prolific scholars on these issues, writes so eloquently in her book, Are Prisons Obsolete? Quote, what would it mean to imagine a system in which punishment is not allowed to become the source of corporate profit? How can we imagine a society in which race and class are not determinative of punishment? Or one in which punishment itself is not the central concern in the making of justice, end quote. What it would mean to imagine a new system is for us to think of criminal justice differently, looking at it in a reimagined way, to try to help people rather than hurt them. It means to try and lift people up rather than harm them. It means removing our blinders so we can see that this criminal injustice system hampers people and destroys them. It treats them as other and harms all of us in the process. Ultimately, this system elevates punishment and retribution rather than rehabilitation and recovery. It creates roadblocks and barriers for those in the system trying to lead a healthy and productive life rather than insist, assisting people to do well. A reimagining would make incarceration the last resort, not the first. Mm -hmm. Remember too that all law is relative. Let me give you an example. When I started as a public defender in 2009, all drug offenses in Riverside were charged as felonies, regardless of amount, especially methamphetamine. Marijuana cases were also charged, and at times, marijuana sales of felony was charged as well, depending on the weight. Yet now, magically, all drug offenses for personal use, unless they're sale quantities, are charged as misdemeanors due to the advent of legislation in California mandating that these drug charges be misdemeanors, and marijuana is now legal. What has changed? Have the drugs changed? No, of course not. If anything, weed is stronger, but our public perception and attitudes regarding drug use and addiction have changed. Most importantly, drug laws have changed. For years, I would watch clients plead guilty over and over to prison for small quantities of drugs. Prosecutors charged these cases zealously, enforcing what we now know, we all know this, to be an unjust law. Those same prosecutors, along with the police, will continue, and they are, to enforce and charge whatever the law allows them to. Cops and prosecutors will go as far as we let them go. If pointing in the air was a crime, law enforcement would feel justified to charge it. 
And perhaps the problem really is, is that these police and prosecutors are taught not to question the laws they enforce. I would argue, however, that it is our moral imperative to use one's discretion. Justice should not be relative. Higher truths always remain the same. What's right remains the same. Philosophically, social justice movements are born out of higher truths, out of the non-relative, out of a deeper knowledge and truth that we humans know in our bones. History has shown us that prosecutors are not the ones who will lead the charge to a more just system or to a reimagining. As I said above, these prosecutors will enforce whatever laws are on the books and do as they are told. They are not rebels. They are not warriors for justice. They are metaphoric lemmings leading my clients off a cliff over and over. That's not to say there's no good prosecutors. There are. There are good ones that try and do the right thing, but their hands are tied many times in this cruel system of injustice. And ask yourself, why is putting a human being in a cage so easy for this system? Where is the caring? Where is the love for our fellow humans? Ask yourself, most especially in pandemic times. <clears throat> Sorry, I skipped a part. I'm going to go back. <clears throat> As the rates of COVID skyrocketed in California during the pandemic, the prisons, jails, and state hospitals were severely impacted and those incarcerated were suffering and dying. Yet there was silence, deafening silence. I am not surprised. Due to adaptation, like I said earlier, we have all been complicit in the creation of an unfair and unjust and dangerous criminal system. But I, for one, will be complicit no more. No more adaptation. It is time for real change and a true reimagination. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I'm going to start with my questions since I jumped on first. <laughs> so mentally ill in, in prison and the, the guards don't even like it. No, they're not equipped. And, 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 and how do we change that? We need more training and we need specialists. We need um, officers and deputies and people in the prisons and jail that are specifically trained to deal with this population. You know, I, I have really good deputies in my mental health court department and um, they tell me how stressful it is. And what the jail wants is to forcibly medicate people. That's their solution. The jails and the prisons and the state hospitals, they think medication will change everything. I don't agree with that. I believe in body autonomy. And I believe that if you force someone down and you hold them down and give them medicine, they're never going to want to take it voluntarily. That said, uh, medicine does play a role in this. So I think it's about having therapeutic um, options for clients. You cannot put a client in a cage that's severely mentally ill and expect them not to get worse. Um, we had a doctor on a stand on the stand recently from the jail, and he said, even your most well-adjusted human who was incarcerated for two weeks, uh, it takes that long to just adjust to the culture and that many people have mental breakdowns in that period. So even if you're pretty well balanced and you're incarcerated, the jail system and the cell system and putting someone in a cage is going to impact you. So to me, I think the solution is more therapeutic programs. You, These people have to have a safe place to go. These are not easy questions. What do you do with a severely mentally ill, violent person? I believe that how we treat them is a referendum on who we are. And that if we don't give them a better place to be, I've had a client call Patton, Patton State Hospital in San Bernardino, Club Med. Club Med, no one wants to be there. Give me a break. I've been there and I don't want to be there. The whole place smells like mold. The staff's fantastic. Some of the best doctors in the state and they get to walk the track. That's why clients want to go to Patton. They're not in a cell. They know that their mental health benefits from not being caged, everyone. So, I mean, I think not putting people in cages, having a better place for people be to be if they're super mentally ill, if we have to imprison them, 
that's the first step, having specialists in mental health as the guards, because they're the ones that are dealing with the clients. I mean, you almost got to create medical wards. And, and we're dealing with, uh, I should ask this question first, because, you know, race and policing. Yeah. In the street. Yeah. The arrests. We talk many times in different uh, venues about the response. Who should respond to these incidents? Yeah. Can you touch on that? Yeah, I have two things to say about that. Um, you know, first of all, I have to tell my clients' families, be careful about calling the police. Very early on in my public defense career, I had a DUI. And um, the, we were trying to explain why the woman was shaking in Peter pants when she saw the police officer. And this is all public. It's in a transcript. And um, the district attorney didn't know, but I did. When I put her on the stand, I said, why did you um, break down when you saw the police? They said she was drunk. That's why she broke down. And she said, no, five years earlier, the Riverside County Police Department killed my son. I called them to my house and they killed my son. So that's one thing. It's hard. If the police aren't trained, then you have a, they escalate the situation automatically. Me and my husband were driving by his dental office in Riverside the other day. And we saw a man with a machete. And I said, oh my God, that's going to be one of my clients. He's like, should we call the police? I'm like, no, <laughs> let me call 211. You know, 211 is the mental health line. So I called that line. But um, the second thing is, these are government statistics I'm going to give you right now. I went to a Department of State Hospital uh, webinar, and we were talking about uh, diversion and why we need it. And their st statistic for the amount of mentally ill people being overcharged due to stigma, and these are all black, brown, and poor white folk, is 40%. So 40% of all incompetent clients probably would not have been charged with the crime to begin with, because there's a lot of petty ones. You know, a person lights a trash can on fire. Someone pushes this person and or scares this, you know, very low tolerance, you know, who knows what race, but very low tolerance, upper scale person, a mentally ill person is saying, I'm going to kill you. I'm an alien. Stuff that doesn't even make sense, right? That's not a criminal threat. That's a delusion. But they charge these clients with penal code section 422. It's the most used code. I only know this anecdotally, but I'm sure it is, against mentally ill people. And it's a felony and it's a strike. And it's words only. You don't need to do any violent conduct. So when you know that you can charge a criminal threats, terrorist threats is what it's actually called, under Penal Code 422 for a mentally ill person frightening someone else. It's a recipe for disaster. What did we expect to happen? And that's what I mean when I call out prosecutors for charging these crimes. There's a prosecutor who reads every police report and they decide what to charge. It's not the police. The, po the police are not charging. It's the prosecutors. Thank you. And if nobody else is ready, I'll ask a question. <laughs> Thank you, Juanita. I appreciate, uh, um, appreciate your comments today and being with us. Um, you uh, describe yourself as an abolitionist, but obviously you're still working in the system as yeah. a public defender. Can, can you, this is kind of a two-part question. One, why do you think it's important to continue participating in, in a system that yeah. you find unjust? And two, what you think of the <clears throat> progressive prosecutor movement where a number of people who served as public defenders are now crossing over to become district attorneys in an attempt to uh, and act reforms internally? Great. Uh, good questions. Thank you so much for that. Um, you know, I still ask myself on a day-to-day -day basis why I still do this work. Um, but I love my clients. You know, I mean, I was also a juvenile delinquent. I have a story about my privilege as a passing half white, half Mexican girl. I used to steal my dad's car um, when I lived in Upland. We used to vandalize downtown Upland. And, you know, I was only uh, almost arrested once and I was sight released. But um, as an adult, I got it. My sister got a DUI and I was arrested, but let's not go there. But as a, as a juvenile delinquent, um, you know, my dad called the police. Why? He didn't care about his car. He was worried about me. He wanted me home safe. And the Upland police would bring me home two or three times. I was never arrested. I was never incarcerated. But nowadays, I would be incarcerated. They charge uh, 
car theft against parents all the time against our clientele. It's a very common charge. So I think I continue to participate because I see myself in my clientele. I see my family. I see my community. You know, I lived in San Francisco, Houston, LA. I thought I would never come back home. But it's only when I came back home that I found myself. As a corporate lawyer, I was very much an Eliza Doolittle. I never fit in. Um, I say maybe I didn't want to fit in deep down. I never felt comfortable. No one knew my dad was a trucker. No one knew my mom was a waitress. No one knew I was a high school dropout. I was told not to tell people that stuff. Um, so I could fit the mold of this square that this, you know, this round hole that the square peg was never going to fit into. And I, I didn't listen to my punk rock music. I didn't uh, wear a lot of eyeliner. And as a public defender, I can. I can have a little flair, you know? Most days I wear a black sweater and a black dress and my thick eyeliner. And some of the judges in Riverside call me a witch. And I like it. I'm like, oh, that's a compliment. Thank you. And so, I mean, that's why I do it. And I have a family. And I have a really good gig right now. Getting to run the first of its kind, the gold standard in all of California, incompetent to stand trial diversion program that we built from the ground up and being the boots on the ground person there. It's a gift. I'm really lucky. Um, the progressive prosecutor movement is something I'm a big fan of. My friend, Tiffany Townsend, who was with LA County public defender for over 17 years, is now with the district attorney's office working with George Cascon. And um, she's his, pretty much his right hand. And so I, I really do believe that that is the way we need to go. But you, I know how hard it is for them. A lot of these people are entrenched. You cannot take a government employee, nor do I want them to, because I'm a government employee, and just get rid of them. You can't. We have a lot of protection for good reason, because we're very valuable with our years of experience. Um, but I'll say this, and this is a little insider information. Last year, the district attorney's office lost 38 attorneys in one month, was the rumor, in one month. So we recently got, because um, we're, the public defenders thankfully have parity now. We aligned with the DA's union. We got a pay raise for the first, my first pay raise other than a promotion in 15 years happened right now. Uh, we had never gotten a scale raise. So, and I've been capped out for a couple of years now. So, I mean, I think that you got to pay public defenders better too. And you got to pay district attorneys well, and you need good people on, give me a good prosecutor. I've had people, I had this client who was so mentally ill, he had a three strikes case and the prosecutor gave me a paper commit time served when he got done with Patton a little early. So I couldn't time him out there. I couldn't put him on a conservatorship. He, they sent him back after a year, but this prosecutor, I will never forget. She told me, don't tell anyone. No, I'm telling someone, but I'm not going to say her name. But if you have a good prosecutor that, that, because I tell my clients stories, I have the families write letters. I, I will beg for our client. Honestly, I don't have a lot of ego. Um, I, I really visualize what I want for my client and I will do anything ethically within the bounds of reason to get it. And I swear the prosecutors trust me. They, they know I have never burned them. They burned me. I have never gone back on my word. I have uh, gifted them like little, like, oh, do, do, you're doing that wrong kind of thing. Or can you help me with this? What is that, Juanita? What's that code? I just, and I, the weirdest thing is I used to be, as a first year public defender, I'd been in corporate law. I was hard ass. No small talk. Don't ask me what, how I'm doing or what I did this weekend. I do the opposite now. I sit there and I talk to them. And, hey, dude, how you doing? How's your day? Oh, I like that outfit. It's just about finding the humanity in these people because they all are human beings that sometimes have really good intentions. So, Juanita, well, yeah. I thought about <laughs> this uh, when you were reading from your essay and you alluded to it a little bit, uh, the system. Yeah. Um. And I don't know if you are interested in addressing it or not. Um, it feels like there is a certain uh, politicization uh, already entrenched in the system. Yes. Uh, there are plenty of DAs that move on to higher office and very few PDs move beyond the bench. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that that is that that whole idea, the law and order idea is what is hamstringing a lot of what you're doing? Oh, definitely. You know, um, they just don't. They're so scared. 
of my clientele and maybe it's not their fault. They don't get a chance to know the clients and their families like I do. Um, within the 1368, which is actually a quasi-criminal civil commitment system, which is totally different sentencing laws than uh, general criminal law, um, I see the same clients over and over. And for years and during COVID, misdemeanors could be committed. That's no longer the case. Every misdemeanor gets dismissed if a person is found incompetent. Takes a little while, but usually within 90 days, it gets dismissed and the client gets to go home or they get to go to hospital or, you know, to ETS. But they're still fighting this. I, I feel almost bad for prosecutors. The wave is, is mm -hmm. against them right now. And a lot of them are leaving because they don't know what to do when they're not the heroes anymore. But it's like, right. be the hero then. I've been a public defender even when I lost every case. But if you go to a jury room now, we are getting so many not guilties just because the tenor has changed. Everyone right. understands that the police lie. Mm -hmm. The police are people and do bad things. And I mean, you used to not be able to attack the police on the stand. You used to not be able to use those inflammatory rhetoric. And I still try not to. I don't do a lot of jury trials anymore. All my trials, if I have to um, litigate the competency issue, are uh, bench trials because they're better Believe it or not, they're better for our clients because judges know the law on incompetency. Right. They don't mix it up with NGI. They they know exactly that the client is going to go to a state hospital system. But I had one client who I talk about in my book. She had burned her parents' house down in the throes of a mental delusion. So it was an accidental setting, a negligent setting at most. They mm -hmm. charged her with murder. Her two parents, elderly parents, died. And her brothers and sisters, when they came to trial, they said, you know, we're the ones that left her in charge of the parents. We're the ones that messed up. She didn't really do anything wrong. This woman had schizophrenia and encephalitis as a child. So uh, she was very impaired. Her IQ was in the 50s. She was like a pretty much like a nine-year-old uh, cognitively. And so when uh, we finally won her case, it took years and years. She was at Patton for over five years. This is when the commitment system held people for three, four years. Mm -hmm instead of two. And so, I mean, that kind of taught me that you can change the world one client at a time, but the political rhetoric, the, I still don't say that client's name aloud because I think they would try to recharge her despite, you know, her being timed out. There's, you know, bad case law on this issue. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know how to fix this is the problem. I just am asking the questions and as someone who works within it, I think I'm uniquely poised to tell these stories, but it's hard. You know, there's privilege. I don't want to be seen as taking advantage of my clients. And so now my next thing is to kind of get over um, my own self and help my clients tell their stories, right? Help. Uh, and I'm doing this within Landia right now. We're going to different colleges and looking because I taught... Um, impacted uh, students impacted by incarceration at PCC recently at uh, uh, one day class. And it really showed me that there's, there's a need for these clients to be heard. And they may not be in the system anymore, but they still have their stories to tell, you know? Right. You. Juanita, could you really quickly, because I think uh, for the benefit of our attendees, you mentioned PC 1368. Um, I think most of them might be more aware of yeah. HS 5150. Yeah. Um, could you kind of really quickly explain the difference? So 5150 is what you use when someone is having a mental breakdown and you want to have them evaluated to see if they're a danger to self or others. And they would go to what's called an ETS or to a, a, a mini hospital and be held for 5150 under 72 hours. And then they can extend to five, 15 days. My system is completely different. When someone is charged with a crime, their attorney can declare a doubt under PC 1368. It's not a certainty because we're not doctors and we don't play them on TV. We're just lawyers. But if we have a doubt as to whether our client can assist us in their defense or reasonably understand what they're charged with and the consequences, we have to ethically declare a doubt. Then we have two doctors. We pick one. The district attorneys pick one from a, a panel list of doctors. Every county has one. 
we have 20, 30 doctors we can choose. And those doctors do what's called an alienist evaluation under PC 1368 as to whether our client can assist us and understand what's going on. There's two prongs to 1368, assist, being able to assist and being able to understand. If they fail either prong, they're incompetent. And then they go from the criminal system to the civil commitment system, and they can be held on a felony for up to two years with no good time at the state hospital. The goal is to restore them and get them back so they can face their charges and the prosecution can get their guilty plea. But now with diversion, we are doing a whole different tactic. We're taking these 1368 clients and we're treating them and we don't care if they're restored. We just want to change their lives and change their family lives. We get them social security. We get them wraparound services. We get them, we put them in a facility for a year that we built. Then we put them in a boarding care. Then we graduate them and make a long-term treatment plan, find them stable housing for the rest of their life. The reality is, is a severely mentally ill person needs support to thrive in the community like most of us do. And for a client that has no family and no friends, they need governmental aid. So that's what we do. We, we've had, oh, sorry, Michael, oh. did you have a, another question? Uh, uh, well, uh, go ahead, Mary. <laughs> uh, I was just gonna try and address some of the, the questions that our audience oh. is asking. Uh, they too are frustrated, uh, probably not as much as you are, but, Let's put this in three parts. First of all, what is a, a punk public defender versus a non-punk public defender? <laughs> How do you control your emotions uh, when, you, um, when you have a new client? Because you seem like you're, you're very passionate about, about your clients as well you should be. Um, and the, the third part is, and you're going to love this question. How do we fix the system? In, in, in 10 words or less, Juanita. Okay, 10 words or less. <laughs> okay, I wrote these down. Punk rock public defender. So yes. for anyone that knows punk rock, it really started with Johnny Cash, who was himself incarcerated. He influenced bands like Social Distortion and X and other punk rock bands. And then we have the Chicano punk rock movement as well in the 70s and 80s. And so for me, punk rock is about you know, looking at a system of dehumanization and how do you challenge it? What is the language you use? So being a punk rock for me now is not really about the music, even though it still is. I still get a show at least twice a month, but it's about, and I'm actually, little shout out, Beyond Baroque on September 23rd, I'm throwing a punk rock Latinx social justice festival with the LA Public Defender, a punk rock band who's cumbia and ska, and uh, four writers who are going to read their punk rock stories. So just a little shout out. Um, and that you can uh, email me at jenmance at yahoo.com uh, for the info. It's completely free at Beyond Baroque, September 23rd. Um, and we're going to have a lot of uh, expungement clinic and all that there. But going back to the punk rock. So it's about a philosophy, right? Um, there's a quote I have that it just really, you know, sets it home. Um, Wait, let me let me interrupt yeah. you for just a second while you're doing that. Yeah, yeah. You said a sponge clinic. Would you like to come back one of these days and talk to our our audience about how you expunge your? Um, I think I think that's a topic that we have yeah. not addressed here, and it it really in, does involve more people of color than oh, yeah. than others. So, um, is it okay if we approach you with a date in the future with? Um, you want to do that? Yeah, we'll do that. And we're actually working on with the, um, I, I can't tell you what organization, but in Landia myself, we're working with a really large organization in the IE to take this punk rock festival and translate it to the IE as well. So, and right. have an expungement clinic. But I do, you know, anyone that needs an expungement, contact the public defender in your county. That's the first step. And I can give more info about that. Okay. So <clears throat> this is the quote from my book. A blue collar aesthetic is at the heart of all of this. As the Chicana writer and activist Sheree Moraga has said much more eloquently than I ever could, there is a language to the blue collar aesthetic. In my memoir and childhood stories about growing up blue collar, I write in that language. Punks sing in that language. 
public defenders fight in this language. The criminal system you see is very much about class and economics, starting with selective enforcement, then bail, then moving to representation, then to gang enhancements and the imposition of the death penalty. In most ways, the criminal carceral system we have created in this country is anti-lower class, which creates a subclass below lower class and working class, which I would call the incarcerated class. People who are in fact incarcerated due to lack of economic privilege, pretrial, people who would otherwise be free to fight their cases on the outside, except for the fact that they are poor. The punk movement was a poor movement. It was a blue collar movement as most musical movements are folk, you know, rap, r and I mean, I love all music. I listen to everything. I had a radio show called Changes that was multi-genre that was about social justice. And if you look at every genre of music from country to rap, to r and to folk, to punk, there is this thread of social justice and blue collar life within it. And when you intersect that, and I can tell you, these kids love this. Kids nowadays, all they listen to is my music. Um, you go to a Pixie show and everyone is 19. When you <laughs> intersect this idea of music, culture, and social justice, it's like fireworks go off. So that's what I mean by being a punk rock public defender. I also wear a punk rock shirt to court under me, underneath my suit that no one can see. I blast my music. I, I use punk rock lyrics in opening statements occasionally. Um, so I'm just quirky like that. Um, the emotional aspect is the hardest part for me. I've had to remove a lot of those barriers um, to be a better public defender and be more present with my clientele. So I don't control my emotions. I don't control my empathy. If I cry with a mother's client, I cry with her. Like, whatever. Like, what's she going to do? Judge me? No, she's going to appreciate it. And I talk to my clients as people. This could be deemed pejorative, but they call me the whisperer. Like, oh, Juanita can de-escalate anyone. But it's just because I'm like, hey, dude, what's going on? Where's your mom? How old are you? Why are you in? You have nowhere to go. And I connect with them on a human level. Put aside the lawyerly rhetoric. When I started, I was all, you know, and I still have a very masculine energy with clients. That helps me control the issues of being a female in this world. Uh, I tend to talk a little tough. So that helps too. Um, and how do we fix it? I do not know. I really don't. If I knew, I would do it. I would move heaven and earth to do it. You know, we've been trying to fix it. There is no fix other than to kind of start over. And um, the recent Humphreys case about bail, um, saying that incarceration should not be the first resort, it should be the last. Um, one thing we could do is hold judges accountable to the law. Judges are violating Humphreys on a daily basis. That's a Supreme Court case. You set your client for bail and they set no bail on, under Humphreys. That's the opposite of what was intended. The opposite. So I think it's about holding people accountable to the law. Judges are scared, rightly so, but whatever. Don't be a judge if you're too scared to like make a good decision. That's how I'm not a judge for a reason. I've been asked and I said, no, I don't want to do that. A judge said, why don't you want to be a judge? I can't incarcerate anyone. And I wouldn't try to. I mean, I know my lane. <laughs> I, that yeah. is not something I'm interested in. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not interested yeah. in being a supervisor. I'm not interested in being a judge. I'm not interested in politics. I like writing and I like dealing with the clients one-on-one. -on -one. Good, good. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, very inspirational um, mm -hmm talk and uh, revelation about uh, revelations about your own life. Uh, I think it always means so much more. Just like, you know, if you're watching a movie, if it's, yeah. if it's based on a true story, it makes it much more interesting, I think. And so for you to reveal so much about your own life and mm -hmm. your work is truly gratifying. And uh, like oh, I said, we're going to, we're going to have you back. I, I guarantee you. Um, so if, if we could, Robbie, if you could remind us, I think I have the, the text here about next week. Um, <clears throat> I have it. Uh, it is going to be called Christianity and Critical Race Theory. 
So uh, we invite our audience in attendance today to come back next week because we think it's going to be, I can't say as stimulating as Juanita's talk, but you know, we'll see. We'll try to we'll try to raise it to that level, Juanita. But thanks mm -hmm. again so much for uh, for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thanks Thank for you. all the beautiful comments in the q and I really appreciate it. If anyone wants to talk to me, I return all my emails. Go to my website, WinitaEmance.com. You can email me. If you want a book, you can't afford it, I'll send you one, okay? Oh, so, fantastic. Thanks. And we need that punk rock event in uh, in the Inland Empire, too. Yeah, so. yeah. And I have to start working on that. We are, and we have a really exciting partner, hopefully. They don't want to be named yet, but I'm hopeful. And it would be a free event, and instead of music... We would use art because we're looking at a museum that we want to use. We yeah, would use yeah. art, culture, and social justice. Okay. And Latinx. Great. Yeah. When you said museum, I kind of know who you're talking about. But <laughs> we're I, trying. I'm we're trying. trying. You never you, know. Okay. Keep working on it. That's a good place. Yeah, they have a yeah, lot of people would, asking. So, you that know, would be, I know. Fingers I crossed. Know. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, thanks again, Juanita. Thank you. We'll let you, we'll let you finish your Coke. Yeah, thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye.